synaptic plasticity and how is the way that neuroscientists think is the fundamentals for uh, learning a memory, okay? So, yeah. what I have here is a, is a neuron, it's a pyramidal neuron in the cortex, and each one of those little things in there are spines, basically those are synapses, and the question that was posed many years ago, decades ago, how the nervous system can code for new memories, how you can in, 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 uh, sculpt new memories in the brain. And actually people thought, and, and there, there are ways of you can do that, one, it could be by changing the electrical properties of the cells. So if the cells become more excitable, for instance, those cells can, can uh, code for a, for a memory. And the problem with that is that we have a limited capacity. So basically, uh, the cell either will fire or not fire, or fire a lot or, or, or not that much. And at that, we don't have much room for encoding that much information. Much better it would be if you change the morphology. For instance, if you grow new dendrites or retract dendrites, you can also, you can have more or less synapses, you can, uh, <coughs> you can call for uh, new information in there in that way. The problem is that that type of plastic changes that actually happen is too slow. Okay? So it will take uh, basically to grow a dendrite, it will take on the order of uh, minutes to hours, whereas a uh, memory can be encoded in, the, in a matter of seconds. So there's a mismatch in time. So the best thing to do, I mean, the best uh, model that we have is basically changes in the strength of the synapses. Okay? And one of the good things about this is that now the idea is that a synapse can, can have basically like a 10 or 20 uh, is, is, uh, states of the strength, and you have about 10,000 synapses per, per, uh, per cell. So basically, you have uh, a huge capacity for the buffer, okay? And uh, this idea, it was first envisioned by Cajal, the guy who discovered basically the old, uh, uh, put forward the idea of the, of the neuron, and also, Everything I'm going to talk today is the inspiration of this guy here. It's called heavy and learning. And this guy made a seminal contribution to neuroscience in the, in the 40s and 50s. And we still talk about heavy and plasticity. And he thought the following. And actually, it turned out that the guy was right almost to the, to the, to the letter in many cases. So he thought, how we can codify that new memory? Let's think uh, in, in, a, in a simple way. So this is a, a, a nervous system, okay, with a, with a few neurons connected, all of them connected, and then you presented a uh, stimuli, and you make all of them to fire. So he asked for two things with this system. One, it was that somehow you have kind of like a recurrent activity, so this guy activates that guy and then activate that one and then activate so you can keep the, uh, the activity going on for a little bit. But more importantly, what you need is that as a result of this co-activation or simultaneous co-activation, you, sh you have to strengthen the connection between the, the components such that next time if you present not not the stimuli by a partial view of the stimuli. The, you you uh, activate the, the system in the same way as you activate the uh, normal. And actually, that's called now is this pattern completion. So set a, a piece of the letter A, and you recognize it's an A, and it's basically that. And the idea is that you have to have some kind of rule to make those connections to be stronger. The whole point of this here is to make those connections stronger. And, and this is the head postulate. And that was written in 1949. And basically, to this, to this day, that thing is true. Okay? And gonna, the whole lecture today is going to be how that thing is true. So his postulate was that when an axon of cell A make the, uh, the there are two cells, cell A and cell B. And when a cell <coughs> A fires and makes cell B fire consistently over time, that connection should be rewarded and make it stronger. Yeah, and that's a very simple rule. So if 
A make B to fire, then, well, that connection should be rewarded. Okay? And that was in 1949. Notably, <laughs> it took like 30 years to somebody else, but oh, what about the opposite? So what happens if cell A fails to activate cell B? In that case, you can say it's kind of like a useless synapse. It should be uh, reduced the strength, should be depressed. Okay. And that was a uh, winter strength, and that was supposed to be in 1973. And those two mechanisms were uh, considered or, or conceived probably 30 years before there was any experimental evidence. Okay, so now we're going to show that how those guys were totally right and actually to the actually to the letter of what they say. So I gotta talk about two things in here. Uh, this is long term for the insulation and long term for the brain. how to make a cement stronger and how to make a cement weaker. And the other I go to this is several stages. The first is what are the rules? What are the activity rules? What really have to happen in the pre and post synaptic uh, connection to make it stronger or weaker. And uh, what have to change in the synapse to make it a synapse stronger or weaker? What are the two key components that need to be changed? And this thing I'm not gonna talk to you about that because time, how you can maintain. Okay, and that's a crucial question that actually is not very well answered yet. But how you can use a change in the synapse to make it stronger and that synapse have like memories have to last a, a lifetime. So you can use a, a memory in 20 seconds, but they have to last for at least 70 years. So how you can maintain that? And that's the question that I'm not going to answer because actually there is not a good answer yet. So what I have here, I put in here is a graph of a research on long-term potentiation. And this is the first report <coughs> of long-term potentiation. In history in 1973, and here's the number of papers published over time, and you can see and uh, that actually there was exponential growth. Actually, that's what when I came here to Hopkins, <laughs> and now sad enough, but I didn't contribute to that. Okay, and uh, here are the three stages that I'm gonna tell you about expression, uh, so the induction, the expression, and the maintenance. And the idea is that. The rules of induction was the first thing that the people worked out. And that was worked out probably by the 1990s. And then the expression it was worked out by the 2000s. And we still talking about how we can maintain that. And all of those uh, uh, progress came about by the development of the hippocampal slice. Okay. So in the beginning, you show that uh, the first demonstration that a synapse can get uh, stronger, it was done in a, in a poor anesthetized rabbit, but it was kind of like a cumbersome. And then, uh, because you cannot control that, that many things, and then it came the development of the slides. So basically what you do is you take the hippocampus, which is a crucial part of the brain for, a, a, for a triggering new memories. And here's in, the, in, the, in a rat or a mouse, here's this thing. So the hippocampus in the mouse is like a little banana that goes right here. Okay? And the good thing about this banana is you can chop it like a salami, all right? And each of these uh, salami slices have two properties which are key, which actually is the gift of nature to neuroscience. <coughs> and the gift of nature is one, you can preserve a fundamental part of the connectivity of the hippocampus. Okay? So the, this is the hippocampus, and uh, we see afferents from the cortex from here. It goes to this part called the ventral gyrus. It goes to here, C3, and it goes to C1, and then the other one. Right. So these are the three most fundamental uh, synapses in the hippocampus. There are more, okay? But these are the more, the more conspicuous and the more important, the one that really uh, do the, the, the job. And the other thing is that it's a very um, resilient preparation. Okay, so you cut it and you can keep maintained for like, say, eight hours or 10 hours, and you're good. Okay. Other parts of the brain don't, okay? So for instance, you can, you can make a, a, a slice of the hippocampus and throw it in the floor, you take it out, don't tell anybody, and then you can use it, okay? <laughs> right? But if you're gonna do the same with, say, the visual, the, the cortex, 
Well, you cannot do that, okay? And actually, you cannot even look too much to the visual cortex because it's going to go bad, all right? So it's very resilient in allowing you to do an experiment that otherwise you cannot do. Then you can, in the slides, you have uh, all kind of control. And basically, what you have to do is just put an electrode in here and record it here. Now, all of those uh, synapses uh, uh, support long-term potentiation. I've been demonstrated in, in all of those, actually, in many other. Uh, but the most classical one, and the, the, the one that is uh, most studied is this one, C3 to C1. And the nice thing about this is that in, if you put an electrode in here, a stimulating electrode, which is a piece of wire, basically, the only thing you're going to stimulate are the axons from those cells. And if you record in here, the only thing that you're going to record are the synaptic response uh, provoked by those axons. So it's very simple. It's easy to interpret. So it's, it's resilient and easy to interpret. Other places, like the cortex, you have six layers, all of them interconnected all over the places. So you put an electrode, you don't know what you're stimulating, and you don't know what you're recording. Okay, so that's it. And with that beautiful preparation, people start studying plasticity. So how you study plasticity is very simple. So what you do is you put here uh, an electrode into this cell. Okay and it stimulates somewhere in here, so the, with this thing, with uh, another electrode. And you get a response. Now the responses are normally, the synaptic response that you're recording here, are normally very stable. So this is the, the percentage of change over time. If you don't do anything, you can stimulate like say one or two per minute, the thing is very stable. And here what they did is they give a high frequency uh, data. I think it's a stimulation. You stimulate it here at one per second, and in here you stimulate at 100 per second. All right? Actually, one per minute and one. So it's basically you just rattle the poor thing. Like, and as a result of that, the thing got stuck out and get potentiated. And actually, it came back, but it never came back and get much more uh, strong. Okay? And if you read it repeatedly several times, you're going to get this in like three or four hours, which is kind of like the amount of time that you can do the, those recordings. Okay? So it's long lasting. And so the, the key thing here is that you induce this long term condensation with only a few seconds of stimulation, and it lasts for a long time. <coughs> okay? And that look like uh, memories. Okay? So you can ask people around, and you can say, oh, what you were doing uh, for when you learned about uh, September 11th, for instance? Oh, I was doing such and such. So people, in a, in a second, uh, uh, put some uh, information in the brain, and then you, you, re you, record, you record that, and you remember that forever, and you take only one second. My classical joke in here is like every animal of the, of the forest know what they were doing when they, they learned that the Bambi's uh, mother was killed. It was kind of like, oh, man, I remember what I was doing. So the, the point is, yes, that's the good of that. The point is, is that this part of, this aspect of ATP, it really look like the formation of memory, something, a, a short event that have a lasting consequence, okay? So in this case, it, it, it look like two or three hours. The Guinness record, for long-term potentiation, it's held by my friend Cliff Abraham in New Zealand. So he did the same experiment, but instead of doing a slice that's gonna go putrefact in a few hours, he put the electrodes in a, in a rat, in a linear rat, of course, and then sealed the thing, and in, in those implanted electrodes can last for a long time. And he did the LTP and record, and record the day after, and the day after, and actually it lasted a year. So a year for the lifetime uh, of a rat is a long time. That's forever, basically. Okay? So you can induce a quick change in the strength of those synapses that last for a year in a rat. So that, I think, is the, is the basis of uh, that's The reason why we think is the basis of memory. Okay? So, but in addition to that, if you want to have a mechanism for storing information, storing memories, you need to have a few properties. Okay? It cannot be just uh, strengthening all over the places. So you need a few things. So you need it have to be rapid induction and persistence. We checked that one. It had to be specific. 
So I told you that uh, 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 a cell, one of those cells, those CA1 cells, can have 10,000 synapses. And what you want to have is a, a system to store information with a lot of capacity. So basically, you don't want to potentiate all of the signals at once, because then the, sto the storage information is basically one, okay, no big deal, all right? So what you wanted to do is to, is to, is to be able to change the strength of each one of the 10,000 uh, synapses independently. That will give you a lot of uh, information capacity, okay? So, so it had to be only, and the idea is that only those um, this, uh, synapses that were activated are the ones that get potentiated, not everybody else. And on kind of related to that, you need some cooperativity. You need a minimal also, a minimal uh, threshold to activate. Okay, one random synapse, you know, that like gets, you know, like a burst of activity, you shouldn't make it. Otherwise, you start, you start to remember a lot of BS. Okay, so you have to keep at least some quality control, and not everything is going to be, okay, and not everywhere. Okay. And associativity, and I'm going to tell you a little bit that because that's the most beautiful aspect of the uh, of TP. So input specificity, only those that are activated or conditioned uh, are, are potentiated. And that was demonstrated in the slides, and that was the good, uh, the, the slides is good for. So you record here the C1 pyramidal cell, you stimulate, but you stimulate two sets of axons, this set of axons and this other one. And they're totally different set of actions. And then what you do, if you will um, uh, give the tetanus to only one, to this one. If when you give the tetanus to this one, I stimulate the high frequency, the other one, you don't activate it. And then you check after. So what happened? This one, this is the, this is the synaptic response. The, the synaptic response gets much bigger. But the other one did not change. Okay, so only those uh, synapses that receive the tetanus, the high frequency stimulation, the 100 per, per second, get potentially zero one. So that's cool. Cooperativity. Okay? So the idea it was that if you take, <coughs> you reduce the stimulation so you only activate. Okay, this guy always put away. One axon, right? That you activate only this axon and you give high frequency, nothing happens. So you have to activate several axons at the same time. Actually, some people measure it, and it's about eight to 10 axons that you have to co-activate. A single axon, even if you activate it at 100 hertz, it doesn't do anything. You have to have a, a minimum amount of simultaneously activated uh, axons. Okay? And that is in a way, as I told you, prevents uh, learning uh, noise. But here is the most beautiful property of LDP. It is, it is associative. And what it means associative? Suppose you are stimulating this uh, input at a very low frequency. And this actually is uh, many of those, okay? So I just put one that for uh, 20 of those. Nothing's going to happen. Now, if you, at the same time you stimulate this one, you stimulate this other set of input at high frequency to produce that. Uh, then you're going to get potentiation not only on this guy, but on this guy, just because these guys were stimulated at the same time as those ones. Okay? So you're associating this with that one, and this kind of piggybacking on the other one. And this is a beautiful, um, uh, it's a beautiful uh, property because it's a synaptic or a cellular model of Pavlovian conditioning. Okay? So you remember those uh, dogs that you train to to salivate with the with the bell, okay, because you, you pair the bell with the steak. So the steak normally make the animal salivate, but with the <coughs> bell normally don't, but if you pair them, you get the bell to do it. So what happened is this is the bell, okay, and this is the, the steak. And this will be the neuron that cause the guys to salivate. So normally the bell doesn't do anything, but if you pair the bell, with the state, if there's a big response, then you can make this go. go. So basically, we can have Pavlovian learning, which is one of the most fundamental uh, ways of learning, in a single cell, basically. And that's the, and that's the cool thing. And that, actually, why is LTP uh, have received so much attention?
So this is a, a, a cartoon that I am uh, just trying to, uh, for you guys to, to gaze at home so you can remember those things. And now we're gonna go, how do you explain those things? Which is like, what happened? So we, uh, it, it turned out that what is crucial is the activation of NMDA receptors. I think you are familiar with NMDA receptors? Would you say no? You're, oh, okay. So I'm gonna explain it to you, the NMDA receptor, very quickly, okay? So this is a synapse, okay? So this is the presynaptic part, and this is the postsynaptic part. The presynaptic part, what it does, you have these vesicles with the, it is basically with the neurotransmitter, and then anytime you have an action potential in here, he will make one of those vesicles to release the neurotransmitter. And these neurotransmitters act on at least two types of receptors the AMPA receptors and NMDA receptors. They have this name for And what happened is that the synaptic response, the, the typical synaptic response, is produced by the AMPA receptor. But, uh, and that's why, because the NMDA receptor have a peculiar property, which normally, so you, if the AMPA receptors bind uh, one of these molecules of glutamate, the neurotransmitter, it, it open and allowed sodium to go in, okay? And that's the synaptic response. But the NMDA receptor open, but it doesn't, uh, not, nothing go through it. Why? It's because this yellow thing, oh, here. this yellow thing is an uh, ion of magnesium, it's a magnesium ion, it's clogging the entrance of the, of the NMDA receptor, and nothing can go through it. Now, and if the cell is the, is, normally the cell, inside the cell, is very negative, so the magnesium try to go in there, okay? If the cell become less negative, like for instance, when you have a high tetanus that they activate everything, it goes from minus 70, typically, to like say, minus 10 or something like that. In that case, the magnesium ion goes away because it doesn't wanna go, in. there's not much driving force for the, for the magnesium to go inside, all right? And in that case, the NMDA now can, can, can uh, it's free to conduct uh, things. And it not only allows my, uh, sodium to go in, but also calcium. And calcium in biochemistry is the magic uh, cation. Okay? Calcium activates tons of things. Okay? And as people realize that is that entrance of calcium into the cell that is uh, going to be responsible for the pain. But because of this, people re uh, and, and, and the way that they notice that is because if you lock this NMDA receptor with, a, with a, an antagonist, basically, with a pharmacologically, then you don't get that right. That's it. Actually, uh, and it was actually found by serendipity. That, that was like in the 80s. So they just uh, discovered the NMDA receptor, and then somebody else just discovered the blocker of, uh, of NMDA. And the guy was studying NMDA receptor, and the guy was saying, no, oh, it's kind of boring. You know? like, what the hell? And then the, <laughs> they said, well, in the last figure of the long paper, like a paper with like 30 uh, figures, they said, well, let's see what happened if I put this blocker and what happened with LTP. Oh, block LTP, well, that's good. And then the guy became famous and they said, like, now a very rich scientist in, in the UK, all right? So basically, in the NMDA, the guy, the crucial thing that you have to have, and it's called, the detector, because remember that hep say this axon A make the cell B to fire, then you can you're gonna get a LTP. So it's basically the activity in A and activity in B are coincidental. Uh, you're gonna get LTP, and actually this NMDA receptor is the molecule that work as a coincidence detector. And why is that? It's because basically. In order for them to fully conduct, to fully work, you need two things. One, the glutamate had to be released from the presynaptic guy, and by here. So that's a, a measure of presynaptic activity, 
axon A being active. And also, you need to remove this magnesium uh, 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 guy that will only happen when this guy is very active, when you polarize. So if the, if the NMDA receptor is capable of detecting the activity of both presynaptic and postsynaptic. And that is why it's called the, the coincidence detector. And, that, and that's actually central for the induction of LTP. And you can explain now all of the properties of LTP, most of them, by this. For instance, input specificity. Why only the active uh, guys, uh, only the active synapses, get potentiated? Well, because the NMDA receptor needs two things. Neither the postsynaptic cell to be very active, but the polarized, okay, not, not minus 70, like something like minus 40, but also it requires presynaptic activity. So only those guys that have a presynaptic activity will be potentiated, even though the whole cell is going to be very active, okay? But only those guys that are uh, presynaptically active will have the two things for the energy. Okay? Cooperativity. So you need a minimal amount of, of, of axon to, to be coactive at the same time. And that is because, well, you need this, uh, the, the memory <coughs> potential of this cell to reach a certain threshold, okay? To remove the magnesium. And you can only reach it with a minimal amount of uh, coactive synapse. Okay, that's simple as that. And associativity, well, it's kind of like the same thing. So if this is not sufficiently, to, is not sufficient to produce uh, the sufficient depolarization to remove the magnesium block, all the synapses in here may help. Okay, and that's the way that uh, to work. Okay, and here is for you to, to remember. That's what I just tell you with my clumsy words. And here's a demonstration of some, some of that. So, as I told you, the, normal, the, the way that people uh, up to now have been uh, inducing this potentiation is by high frequency stimulation. But actually, the reason why people use the high frequency stimulation is simply because of these properties of neuron called summation. Okay? So, yeah. oh, ah. Let's put, this is the membrane potential, which is normally minus 70 or so. And here, I will put the magnesium uh, threshold to remove, okay? So normally, if you activate one synaptic response is going to be like that. And if you give another one very quickly, it's going to go on top of the second one. Okay? And you go. And eventually, you're going to cross the threshold for the removal of the magnesium, and then you're going to get a TP. Okay? That's the idea how the tetans work. Okay? Of course, if you do this, at low frequency, they never zoom out, and then uh, that's the reason why you have to do the high frequency. But that means if the only thing that you need is to reach the voltage, the memory voltage for removing the magnesium, you don't have to give high frequency. You can do it another way. You can just pump current into the cell so you can, uh, you can, uh, you can move the memory potential to there. Okay. And this is this experiment. So in this experiment, since they are recording, you can inject current, positive current, and then actually you're going to make yourself to be depolarized, to be this potential. Okay? So in this experiment, what they're doing here, they're stimulating and record the responses. And in this moment, they keep stimulating at the same frequency. They don't change the frequency, but what they do is to inject current, such as now in here. And then they stop it. And then actually you can induce LTP. So you can induce LTP with low frequency stimulation. All right? So, summary. So you can use it with the tetanus, <coughs> with the very low <coughs> frequency stimulation, and it's blocked by NMDA receptor antagonists, and also hyperpolarization within the tetanus. Okay? So if you, this is what the tetanus does, if you actually inject current to make it negative, 
then you're going to eliminate the simple by that. Okay. Uh, so what calcium does? I'm just going to go, yeah, quickly this. Calcium activates probably, I think if you go into the literature, you will say there are probably like a 200 molecules that people claim that the calcium activator is good for ATP. Okay? So forget about that. So, and everybody will claim that their molecule is the most important. But everybody, the most common thing, it will be this, uh, this uh, molecule called chemkinase 2. And this is a, it is a protein kinase that is particularly activated by calcium. Okay? And one of the, and this is the most uh, common uh, effector of uh, calcium. And the experiment, oh, Oh, that's pretty bad. Here, I explained the whole experiment, and I, and I guess I, I lost it. All right. Anyway, I'm going to have to explain it with my words. So in this experiment, <coughs> what they do is this uh, enzyme, chemkinase, uh, you activate it with calcium. And remember the NMDA, let calcium in. So basically, the idea would be that calcium in activated chemkinase. How you can demonstrate that? Well, what you do is you take a flask of food of chemkinase, put some calcium in there, activate it, and then put it in the little pipette that you're using to record from the cell. So now the activated chemkinase is gonna flow inside the cell. And if, it, if the consequence of NMDA receptor is the activation of the chemkinase, if you're providing chemkinase, active chemkinase by yourself, then you don't need to do the tetanus, you don't need to do anything. And basically this is shown here. So what you have here, here you, you penetrate into the cell, and here you can see that in this experiment when you have this pipette uh, for recording with a cam kinase active in there, you start to get a bigger response. Okay. Not shown in here, at that point the guys tried to make a tetanus and nothing happened because tetanus, uh, LTP was already induced. Now in this one, what they have done here is they take the same cam kinase, but they boil it a little bit to inactivate. And in that case, nothing happened. But when you go in here and you try to use the tetanus, then you do the tetanus, you get, then you do LTP because uh, LTP never happens. Okay? You follow that? I see the Come here. You got it? Okay. <laughs> I take it your word. <coughs> All right. So the important thing is that if you put a good uh, activated cam kinase, you mimic LTP, basically. And you, don't, you, and you can bypass the NMDA receptor and you bypass uh, all of those things. Okay. So the expression. I think we're going to change it here because this. So what did change? So OK, so I, I activated the NMDA receptor, but now I'm going to make the synapse stronger. How I can make the synapse stronger? And here are the possibilities. On the presynaptic side, I, I tell you that you release a vesicle with the neurotransmitter, so you can do two things. Either you can, in each one of these vesicles, you can put twice as much as a neurotransmitter, and then you're going to get twice as much as possible, more or less, some you know, linearity involved. Or you can increase the probability of release. I don't know if you are familiar with the, with the with the synaptic transmission, but actually any time you get an action potential at the end of the terminal, not always you release a vesicle. You release with a probability of release. Okay, a, pro a probability with another one. Very often it's kind of very low, actually. These cells in the, these cells in the hippocampus, these synapses in the hippocampus that I've been telling you, the probability that they release a vesicle upon uh, an action potential is very low is 0.1. One out of ten times they will release the vesicle. So if you increase that that probability of release, you're going to get a bigger response on average because normally you're recording for several, that you know, several axons. Okay, I think you want. Now, but postsynaptically, you can have more receptors. You can have more of those ampere receptors. You put twice ampere receptors, you get twice the, the response easily. Or you make it they change the properties of the receptor. You make it they open bigger, they open more often, all kind of things. So this actually was one of the most interesting times of uh, synaptic plasticity fields in the 90s. 
because the field was <coughs> bitterly divided between the Christian of the guys and the Boston of the guys. And you will go to the conference and those guys say, you cannot say that because you are And then the boss, and I was a kid in there, but it was kind of fun to, to watch all of those guys fighting. All right? And so the camp was divided between the presynaptic side and the postsynaptic side until the presynaptic guys make an incredible creative experiment that switches the whole thing to the presynaptic side. And a, this is a good start. So, as I told you, synaptic release is a probabilistic uh, a phenomenon. So sometimes you get it and sometimes you don't. Okay. So here what we have, this is if this is a what is called mini a, with a single axon stimulation. So here you need one single axon and you are getting the effect of that. So sometimes it's a, as I told you it's a probabilistic thing, sometimes you don't release anything. Sometimes you release one vesicle sometimes you release two vesicles and sometimes you release three vesicles. So you can actually you can make here a histogram, you know, failures, one vesicle and two vesicles and three vesicles. You can see that, all right? Now, it, uh, and, and very often it's failed, okay? Most of the time it's failed. So this is the number of cases that you get a, a failure. So now they, they took that uh, diagram and then they do RTP. And what the guys found it was brutally that you get more uh, more vesicles, but actually a fewer failures. So you can comment or you can discuss, you know, whether you have more vesicles or not. But the the a reduction of the probability of failures is an increase in the probability of release. I mean, decidedly, okay, you, you will follow that. Okay. So the fact that they are getting less failures it means that you have more release, and that for a while is settled. The, the thing. This thing is just we are controlling the probability of release. Right. Now, that was part of the story. The next part is very cool because it was totally the opposite. And actually, the field of plasticity is. I think it has been driven basically by people with bright ideas, okay? And as I told you, here have these bright in insightful ideas, and this is another insightful idea that, uh, that it was uh, uh, advanced by Francis uh, Edwards. Actually, it's a bright woman. At the beginning, I thought it was a, a man, but it's my misogyny, okay? But it's a bright woman, and this idea is beautiful. And it's the following. So she said, <coughs> okay, so we have a failure, but just because we have a failure, it doesn't mean it's a presynaptic failure. It's not a, a failure of release. And here's the, cre the, the creative thinking. She said, well, most of the experiments that people do, they do it in very young tissue because it's easy to, to manipulate and it's easy to record. And in, <coughs> and in very... Uh, uh, so that's one thing. And the other thing is like all of those, in do all those experiments you maintain for, for simplicity of the recordings, the voltage of the cell at a very negative, at a very ne negative uh, voltage. Okay. And, and she said, well, what happened if the, the, the synapses, when they're born, they only contain an MDA receptor and no amber receptor? So what will happen? Well, if you're going to see this one and you're keeping this, uh, this synapse at a very negative voltage, you're not going to see anything. Because remember that an NDA receptor is normally clogged by the magnesium uh, ion in there. So if you record from a, a synapse that only contains an NDA receptor and you're maintaining the, the cell at a very negative state, you're not going to see anything. You're going to say that's a failure. There's no synapse in there. Now, Suppose that what happened is that after LTP, after inducing LTP, what you're getting is that you're getting the insertion now somehow of AMPA receptor. Okay. Now you're gonna see a response. So you go from a situation in which you have no response first, and now you have a response, but it's not because it's a change in the probability of releasing vesicles, but it's, it's basically 
before you didn't have any any amperes at the man you have it. You follow that? Okay. And they call it that silent setups. Okay. And that was a huh? Excellent question, beautiful. So it turned out that many, so first of all, you have a noise. In all of these things, you have noise, and you can have that. But interestingly, when the animal is very young, synaptic inhibition provided by gabaergic uh, uh, receptors, it's involved the chloride crossing the membrane, is actually the polarizing, it's excitatory. So in the very young guys, in the, in the rats, for instance, postnatally, GABA, in, there is no inhibition, basically. In, inhibitory synapses are actually excitable. Okay. And then what happened, because all of these uh, synaptic changes depend on the gradients. Okay. If you have more of the, of, uh, of the iron in there, than like here, the iron will go this way and the other way around. But what happened is that when the animal is very young, the, the, the gradient of the chloride is the opposite of the dogs. And all of that is because you have different set of uh, transporters. Okay. But basically, in the young guys, inhibition is going to help excitation. And once this is done, basically, inhibition will go to inhibitors. That's it. This is a beautiful uh, chapter of neuroscience, but I have to talk now only about this part. OK, so evidence for that. Uh, only two minutes. OK, yeah, I'm going to go for the answer. Uh, so this is the first, we're going to go to this one. This is the first demonstration that actually you can have a synapse without uh, receptors and then after a TP have upper receptors. What they have in here is the culture cells, okay, and they infect it with a virus that forces the cell to produce a lot of AMPA receptors with a tag, with a GFP, a fluorescence. Okay, so you can illuminate it with one wavelength and, uh, and, get the, and get the excitation back, and then you can see whether the, the, the signal is. So basically, this, okay, this uh, is the, the, the dendrite full of this, um, so to speak, full of this uh, AMPA receptor with a fluorescent tag. Okay? And what happened, and you only have to follow in this part, what they do is they do LTP in this moment. This is before and this is after. And you can see that in A, there was nothing here. And now you have that spine full of amper receptors. So there was a, a, a spine in here that it was empty of amper receptors. And now it was full of amper receptors. Okay? And that's basically a silent synapse that became non silent. Okay? This, this guy didn't have any, and now it happened. So now, that was done in the early 90s, late 90s, okay, and that was kind of fast. Uh, the technology now have advanced, and now this is a state of the art. The guys are showing basically the same thing, okay, but not in culture cells, but in a live animal behaving, and then they're stimulating our, our whiskers, and then you can see that stimulating the whiskers of the rat, and then you can produce and <coughs> these little arrows, you can get more from here to here, you get more amber receptors, okay? And these are amber receptors are only for us when they're outside, uh, outside of the membrane. So it's basically a lot of uh, uh, technological improvements are going, uh, have happened since then. But basically, but it's the basically same principle, okay? So the guys make a very beautiful, uh, Conclusion with about the uh, images, and now we're confirming with the images. And since we are about to finish, because is that 420? Yeah. Okay. So this is basically this is the the, the model that people uh, people have is that activation of the NMDA receptors produce calcium, and the calcium activate cam kinase, and somehow. It enforced the, the the movement of amber receptors that were kind of outside of the synapse to get into the synapse and get trapped an anchor in there. Okay. So so these guys it was kind of like in the, in the, on the side of the synapse and now it goes in here. And that's what it is. Okay. This little arrow here. All right. 
so and the and the and how can kindness do that? Nobody knows. Okay, or I mean, or there are like twenty-five thousand different theories about or experiments and stuff like that. But the, basically, the fact is that after LTP, the the receptors that were kind of like uh, diffusely around here, they get inserted into the into into there. And I was supposed to talk about LTD, which is the other way around, but basically. I'm gonna skip everything except I'm gonna tell you that LTD, the depression, it also requires an NDA receptors. And people were saying, whoa, why, why is that? You know, to, to put the uh, ample receptors, you require an NDA receptors. To take them out, you also require an NDA receptor. How? Explain that to me, okay? And the explanation is simple, okay? So basically the idea is the amount of an NDA receptor activation. If you activate a lot of them, you get a lot of calcium, and you get a lot of this chemkinase, all right? But if you don't activate a lot, like, like a, a little bit, all right? Uh, you activate basically phosphatases, and those phosphatases undo the, 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 the work of the chemkinase, okay? So the kinases are good for putting the receptors in the synapse, and the phosphatases are good for taking them out. And both of them are commanded by NNDA receptors. In one case, you need a lot of calcium to do it, and the other one you need a little bit of passing to do it. But basically, that's the same. All right? Yeah, I have three minutes over, so. Yeah? Good. My, my understanding is until 2.20, is that true? Yes. And, and it's 2.15. Huh? It's 2.15. 2.15? Well, this guy here says, <laughs> 223. Sorry, guys. Okay, so, well, I, Jesus. It's a computer. Okay. So, all right, so then I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the company TV because it's the, other, it's the other side of the thing. So. Um, and there is a. Anyway. So, not only, uh, and there was a good, people start to look for uh, LTD after the successful elucidation of LTP. And there's two good reasons, okay? Or actually, one good reason. You cannot have just LTP. You cannot just potentiate the synapse. I mean, eventually, you're gonna saturate them. I mean, you, you cannot cram, you know, 10,000 ample receptors in a poor spine, and the thing is gonna explode, all right? And the idea is that when you have, any time you learn something, it's not just more, uh, more strength of, of a synapse, it's just redistribution. And you can see it easily if you take a, a rat and teach them, okay, in a, in a, in a classical uh, uh, paradigm like a Pavlovian, go to the left because in the left you get the water. And the guy goes in there and get a DP to get the water in there. And then you change the paradigm and say, no, the water now is in the right. Okay, so now the rat has to do LTP for the other part of the other synapse, namely going to the right, but also have to do LTD and do the previous level. Okay. So anytime, very very often when you're switching preferences, it means two things: potentiate the new preference and depress the older preference. So you need LTD, you need both LTP and LTD. So people were looking for those, <coughs> and here is how you get normally in the in the lab. So people were looking, and the question was, how, which would be the paradigm for getting it? And this is a beautiful thing, because I was there when, when LTD was discovered. So I was, the, uh, I was a postdoc and the, and the graduate student who discovered that. She was trying to do different paradigm, different frequencies, and stuff like that, and that. So I say, okay, I'm gonna do a very short stimulation with one hertz. Okay, so we need a high frequency stimulation for LTP, 100 hertz. Let me try short frequency stimulation for a few seconds, not that much. And then, but it was the day when the speaker came to give seminar and it was the pizza lunch. So she went there and then she tried to eat the pizza and forgot that she was setting the, the low frequency stimulation. And when she came back, you know, oh crap, my, my experiment. She came back, like 20 minutes had passed, you know, and they would give it one hertz stimulation all the time. And say, ooh, and then she found the whole thing depressed. And then she repeated, and it turned out that actually one uh, prolonged low frequency stimulation did it. Okay? 
And then with that, the first question she asked, it was, well, if NNDA receptors are so good for LTP, well, if I give you one head stimulation, low frequency stimulation, and give a blocker of LTP, I should get even uh, uh, more LTD, more depression. I'm gonna block the NMDA receptor then. And she blocked the NMDA receptors and actually she couldn't get any any LTD. So that was a weird stuff. You know, you're expecting to have more LTD because you're eliminating the potentiation and now you get nothing. Okay? And then that was when when people start to to work out on the on the on the mechanism and it turned out actually that is the difference of effectors. Okay. So the chem kinase, you require a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, activity, a, a lot of calcium for them. And the cool thing is that with low, with, if you don't do anything, nothing happens. Okay. If you activate a little bit of the NMDA receptor, a little bit of calcium, you get the phosphatase activity. And then with more, you get the chem kinase activity, but the chem kinase beat the phosphatase. So actually, so at that point you have both chem kinase and phosphatase, but the chem kinase is much more, much more active, so it overrides the, the phosphatase, and that's the way that you get that. Right. And I think, yep, and yeah, there's all the type of LTPs and LTD that we don't care. Okay. Next time we are going to talk about uh, uh, how you use LTP probably in real life, okay, how that happens in, in, the, in the brain. And I'm gonna talk about the other thing. And now it should be like about 4:20. What time is it? Oh, perfect. Yeah.